recording now. And so, well, let's just dig into our example exam. So the first question was about processes. So you've all worked with processes and fork in Unix and the practical exercises. So the first thing was really checking if you understand processes and their execution order maybe. So the first question was about how many times the following program given here on the bottom right would actually print hello world. And you should also draw a simple tree diagram to show the parent child hierarchy of these spawn processes. So as you see, we start with one single program that has a main function and then this function uh, uses a loop iterating three times, zero, one, two. And then in each of these iterations, fork is called. Now, what you needed to figure out for this is actually, you needed to know that when you do a fork, that the state of all variables is copied using copy on write usually. And then when you do some changes, then you have separate copies of this. So when you go through this loop for the first time for i equals zero, you create one additional process with a fork. And then both processes continue in the loop with i equals one. So each of these processes, the original one forks again, and the one we just forked for iteration i equals one, for, uh, i equals zero forks again. So now we have four processes. And then all of these processes go through this loop again for i equals two. So all of them fork again. So the original process forks another copy and all of the other processes we forked. So overall, we have this relationship here in our tree diagram here with parent and child processes. And overall, then all of the processes run into this printf line after finishing the for loop. So we have eight processes, each of them prints uh, the hello world text once. So in the end, we have eight times hello world as an output. Okay, so the trick here really was to know that fork copies the state of a process so it doesn't start from scratch. So it would actually keep the information about in which loop iteration we are and then continue from that instead, for example, of starting that loop from scratch for each new process. The second one was also entitled process execution order. That was a bit unfortunate. We could have called this like process synchronization, but no matter what. So we have another example program and this example program now used this macro here, which we explained how this works because I think we haven't discussed this hash X in detail. So hash X just means it is enclosed in double quotes to, uh, to serve as a string. So essentially we have this write macro, which writes to standard out a string with the size of a string. And then we use it twice to write an A, uh, thrice to write a B and down here to write a C. Now in between we do some fork, and then in whatever uh, process uh, is the parent process here. So this gives, uh, gets a return value not equal to zero. So if child is not equal to zero, then we wait for any child process and then we can output W of C. So we can output a C. So the question here, what are all the legal outputs? So what are all the valid execution orders that can actually take place in such a program? So for this, question you had to know that the order in which parent and child processes continue to execute after returning from fork is not fixed. It can be the parent first or the child first. And of course you had to know how a wait for a process works. That's something we discussed in one of the practical exercises. And so if you actually play through all the possible sequences of execution of parent and child process, then you get two possible output orders. So first is A, B, B, CC. So both child processes actually manage to output their B first before they run into C. And the other one would be an interleave of A, B, C, B, C. Would a legal output be if the fork call fails as a question? That's a good question. Uh, if you have 
noted that uh, with your answer that that would also be a legal output then we would certainly accept this but uh, yeah we, we should probably add that you should assume something that a fork call wouldn't fail to make it more clear but yeah thanks that's that's a good comment all right the next question was about shell pipelines and we invented a bit of an artificial setting I have no idea what you could really use this for. So a very special Unix shell to implement B bidirectional pipes using this A less than and greater than B uh, syntax on the shell instead of a pipe symbol. And this means that not only the standard output of A should be connected to the standard input of B, that's what a usual pipe would do, but also we have a link back so that everything B outputs would appear on the standard input of A. So we would create a bidirectional pipe here. And that's of course possible using file descriptors. And we have given you a piece of a C code that is an excerpt of a shell implementation to implement this behavior. And unfortunately, we gave this to a very uh, inexperienced programmer. So this contains a number of errors. And your task should be to find the errors to indicate where they are, and then describe the problem uh, that uh, shows up here and propose a fix to actually implement the behavior we wanted to have. So unless I'm mistaken, I found five errors in this code. So uh, these are marked in red here and numbered one to five. So the first one is uh, we define constants for the read and write index in our uh, file descriptor arrays, pipe one and pipe two. And obviously C arrays start at zero. So we would have to have indexes zero and one. If we would use an index of two with arrays dimension that way here, we would get a buffer overflow. So you would actually have to change the definite definition for write to use the constant one instead of two here. So that's a very simple error, obviously. A related error is an incorrect dimensioning of the second pipe array. So this would only mean that it has one element. Of course, we need two elements, even if we throw away one of those by closing it soon after. The second one, the third one was probably easy to find if you do some visual pattern matching in your head. So here we just accidentally swap the parameters for dub2. So this would actually copy the standard in file descriptor to the file descriptor in our pipe2 array here. And that's the wrong way around because then we wouldn't be able to do standard input redirection. Uh, the fourth error was the second close command here. So we close both sides of one pipeline. Well, that's obviously a problem because then we couldn't do any communication at all because one of the processes would be unable to read or write. And the final one was maybe a bit tricky and that's down here, number five. And so this was uh, checking if the result of fork is not equal to zero. So essentially in a shell, you would want two child processes uh, for a pipeline that connects two processes. So you would have to generate two child processes here doing the pipelining stuff. So this final check here in the if statement would also have to check for equal to zero uh, to actually execute this code in the second child process instead of in the shell, because otherwise this shell would simply terminate and never be able to return. So these are the errors here. I hope I found all of them. It was intended to be five errors for five points, obviously. And uh, yeah, I think if you worked on your shell, that was a bit of transfer. Obviously, you had to work on, but I hope this was pretty obvious. Question number three was about threading. And uh, here we were especially checking if you understood critical sections here. And uh, uh, there's a question on, on fork. I'll, I'll try to answer it later. I hope that's okay. Uh, so uh, essentially there is a very primitive excerpt going on here for two threads. So the first thread executes this piece of code between lines three and seven, whereas the second thread running in parallel sets this whatever variable, this memory location to zero to null. So the problem here is that uh, we 
do an F put S using this output file descriptor here. And we check if this is not equal to zero. So if it's zero, then this output file descriptor would not be initialized. So F put S would probably crash. Now the problem is these threads run in parallel in any possible interleaves. So what could happen is that first this check is performed by thread one, then we switch over to thread two, the uh, variable is set to zero. And then after this check succeeded, it was set to zero and now it's used. So even if we checked it here, it's shared memory because we have threads, it's set to zero. So we have what we call an atomicity problem here. So the test of this proc info and its use in the later input statement, uh, F put S statement in line five are a critical section, but they're not enclosed in anything marking a critical section. Uh, so essentially we have to do something about this. So one proposal was a change and the change was to put weight and signal around our F put S statement here. And the question was, this, does this actually fix the problem? And no, it doesn't because it just protects the F put S. But what really needs to be protected is this whole critical region, which I marked in this blue box here, because we need to make sure that nobody would interrupt uh, us between checking for the validity of this proc info variable and using it in F put S. So this would have the same effect. Uh, and this would not solve the problem. And that's actually a real world code using separate threads in the MySQL database server. So an open source database server that was there for quite some years, but I think that was like something 15 years ago. Question four was about deadlocks. So here we had three threads uh, using number of locks. And uh, of course, again, thread one was executing code in lines four to eight, thread two in lines 11 to 15, and thread three, the ones down here, 18 to 22. And uh, we would initially assume that all three mutexes are initialized as non-locked as shown up here. And we would also assume that threads can execute in any arbitrary interleaving. So we could switch between, for example, line four to five to another thread, maybe here, and then switch again between lines at 11, 11 and 12 to number three and so on. So essentially between all of these lines, in practice, it would be between machine uh, instructions implementing these instructions, but you can just assume between these lines, actually a process which can happen. So the question was, the first one was, can there be a problem when we execute this multi-threaded code? And if so, show an interleaving that would result in the problem, or if not, explain why not. Well, consider we start with thread one, this one locks L1, then we have a thread switch after line four, over to thread two, this locks L3, then we have another thread switch, over to thread three, this one locks L2. So now we could try to switch back to thread one. This would wait for L2, but it wouldn't be able to get L2 because that was locked by thread three. So we could continue with thread th two, which would wait for L1. Can't get it because this is already locked by thread one. And we could finally switch back to thread three. This would wait for L3. Now, unfortunately, that's held by thread two. So here we have this circular wait condition, which is important for deadlocks to occur. So really, uh, you may have noticed, I, I handed out a lecture 24, which is an overview with a lot of self-testing questions about things you should know, you should be able to explain and understand. And the video is also out there. So these conditions for deadlocks necessary and uh, uh, the additional condition you need for deadlocks to actually occur. These are very central and very important for operating systems. So we have this circular waiting condition and we have these additional conditions like, for example, that you cannot take away a resource once it's allocated. You uh, allocate resources one at a time. Look it up in the lecture slides if you don't really know what I'm talking about right now. So, the next question was, if there is a problem, propose a fix. Now, obviously, uh, if there is no problem, don't propose a fix. And we would have given five points for this, probably not. So you should have guessed there is a problem. 
and uh, with a constraint that really each critical section, that's a bit of artificial constraint, obviously, that each critical section requires two different locks and you cannot change this assumption that these two different locks for the critical section are required. So obviously we have a problem as we found out in part one of that question. And the solution would just be to have all of the threads acquire their locks in order. So L1, L2, L3, and again, release them of course in the opposite order. And that would actually solve the problem. Uh, and we wouldn't have had any uh, problems with deadlocks here. Question number five was about memory management. So uh, we uh, had uh, discussed several memory allocation approaches and one of them is the body allocator. So body allocator is a dynamic memory allocation method and the property of body allocators is that you split up your allocatable areas in powers of two and you round up all allocations to the nearest power of two if they're not exact, exactly a power of two. Uh, so we had a memory of 32 megabytes split in two megabyte blocks. So zero, one, two, three, up to 30, 31. And uh, we already had some initial allocations like the first eight megabytes here are allocated by A and those two are allocated by B. And then you would have to figure out what the final memory layout would look like after yeah, executing the requests in this given scenario. And these scenarios were independent from each other. So they're not allocations one after the other. So here process C requests three megabyte. We had a very convenient free block of four megabyte available here. So we round up the three megabytes to four and we could place the memory for process C right in here. So we wouldn't have to split another block here because you would love to have as big blocks as possible which are free. Scenario two had a different initial condition here. So we had uh, the first couple of megabytes allocated by A here and uh, process D requests 12 megabytes. So 12 megabytes implies that we have to round up to the next power of two again, which is 16 megabytes. So we would have to find a free block of 16 megabytes, which is aligned to a 16 megabyte border and that's just the second half of our memory here. So we could put our 12 megabytes here and we would have wasted four additional megabytes here because we're always rounding up. Scenario three had this initial condition with two, uh, two megabyte blocks allocated for B here from four to seven and another four megabyte allocated from 24 to 27. And now we had a process E that requests 14 megabytes. So we know we have to round this up to 16 megabytes. Now this would actually fit in here. However, the starting point of this block is not divisible by 16 because it's eight. So we cannot let the block start here with a body allocator. So we cannot find any contiguous block that has 16 megabytes available because here's A, A is in the way and here B is in the way. So even if we have lots of memory free, in this case, we cannot satisfy the request using a body allocator. And finally, we have scenario F uh, four where process F requests seven megabytes and uh, this requires an area of eight megabytes. So we have to started here. So we have to split, for example, the second half into two eight megabyte blocks and maybe put F in the first one of those. Actually putting it in the second one of those would also just be feasible because that would just be one or the other, but usually you use the first one that fits, but both solutions would have been correct. Uh, 5.2 was concerned with fragmentation. So this was asking you to define fragmentation and explain where fragmentation, this specific fragmentation type shows up. So we have two different sorts of fragmentation. One is external fragmentation. So this means that memory fragments that cannot be used for additional allocations are created outside of the allocated memory area. So we allocate the exact amount of memory, but then we have some waste outside of it because we have very small blocks in between. And this happens for list-based strategies such as first or best fit. And uh, internal fragmentation 
means you have unused memory inside of the allocated memory areas. So, uh, so we've seen this just a bit ago with the body allocator. So for the body allocator, you would waste memory internally into each allocation because you have, for example, a seven megabyte allocation, which for which you have to allocate an eight megabyte block. So here's another question to five one scenario three. Let me go back. If you add the middle blocks in scenario three, it is still a power of two. Why is this not a legal solution? Because a block that has a size of a power of two, like 16 megabytes, always has to start at an address that is evenly divisible without rest at this border. So essentially there's only two places here to uh, place a 16 megabyte block. This would be starting at zero. So zero divided by 16 is zero without rest, obviously. And that would be 16 is the other one. So either you store it in the first 16 blocks or in the second 16 blocks, but it's not possible to use the blocks in between with a body allocator. I hope that clears it up. Yeah. So uh, yet another question about uh, memory management was virtual memory. And here I was uh, interested in the relation between a hardware component and why it is actually required to build efficient computers using virtual memory. So the interface between the OS and the hardware. And here you should explain what a TLB is. So first, uh, when, when a question like this shows up in an exam, if there's an acronym, you should probably try to expand it. So a TLB is a translation local site buffer. And you can explain it very shortly and say it is a cache for page table entries. And then you can give some explanations. I went a bit further with the explanations here, so you don't need to go into that much detail, but uh, it can't hurt. But please, if you have a question that gives like three points, don't write three pages of, uh, of an answer, because if you get three points, you're not expected to spend that much time on it, for example. I haven't checked how many points you actually got for that question right now. So page tables are stored in main memory. So whenever we would have to resolve a virtual address to a physical address without having a TLB, we would have to consult our page tables. Page tables are usually stored in a hierarchical system. So they're a sort of a tree. And you would have to walk this tree from the top, from the root of the tree to the page entry here. So for example, a typical page table on x86 machines could be three levels deep. So you would need to access three main memory locations before you would be able to retrieve the physical address belonging to the virtual address that was actually required for one single memory access. So this would mean for every single virtual memory address, you would need three additional physical memory accesses uh, to actually obtain the virtual address. And this is uh, then simplified or improved by using the TLB because you cache such a looked up page table entry in the TLB. Obviously the TLB is a cache, so it's relatively small. So this only works because of the so-called locality principle. So you could, if you want, explain shortly temporal spatial locality here. So this means, for example, that a program is using 20% of its memory address range 80% of the time. And these 20% are much more probable to fit as translations to fit in the TLB than all of the translations, because you usually have very few translation table entries. Like for example, 64 pages only, which 64 times four kilobyte, you can figure out would only cover a memory range of 256 kilobytes, which is not a lot considering the size of programs today. But again, this is actually giving an explanation for you to think about. And if you have worked on that question yourself, you can try to mix and match and see how much of these topics here, especially the ones printed in, in italics and bold, you have actually mentioned here. So caches, page table entries, page table walk, and maybe locality principles would be the important points to mention here. All right, then we went uh, further to discuss scheduling. So of course, all scheduling tasks and operating systems are very theoretical and abstract. So we had a system with three processes, which had some compute time of like 70, 110 and 90 milliseconds. 
and we had IO start and duration time. So IO start was always relative to the start of the process. So that was obviously not an absolute time and IO durations. And then uh, you should use this Gantt diagram here. Maybe that was a bit unusual because I took this from one of our earlier German exams here, which I just remember you see, this is the word legende, which is just the German word for legend. Sorry for that, oops. <laughs> Anyways, uh, so uh, you should actually fill in the scheduling and we already filled in the first two time steps for our processes. So uh, processes are activated in order P1, P2, P3, and they're all ready to run at time T equals zero. Since we only have one processor, that was implicitly assumed here because we didn't talk about multi-processor scheduling, but we should make that clear, obviously. This means P1 starts first, it gets the CPU, and uh, we know at time relative to its start time point, 20 milliseconds, it would start an IO process, and that IO takes 80 milliseconds. So we will fill the next eight rectangles here with a dot, indicating that we would perform IO. Now, as soon as we start IO, we can start another process uh, on the CPU. So that would be P2 then. And P2 can compute for 30 time units because before it starts an IO of also 30 time units here. So here we have three compute rectangles here and three IO rectangles. So now P1 and P2 are blocked. So P3 can start. P3 had to wait, it was ready. So we give dashes here. And then P2, uh, P3 can actually start. It can compute uh, for, for a number of units before it actually starts uh, to continue here and so on and so forth. I think really going through all of this is a bit tedious. So the important thing, this is round robin scheduling here with a chosen time slice of these 40 milliseconds here. So essentially the important thing is here that the CPU is released after 40 milliseconds here. That's the important one and not every 10 milliseconds here. Maybe that was a bit tricky. And also important was that each process performs only one IO operation. So this takes just some time to check and recheck if you really get it right to see if all the dependencies are fulfilled and in turn, this is why this relatively simple looking task actually also gave 10 points. Question number seven was concerned with file IO. So uh, here we uh, assumed that we had a file already called my file two, and we would execute the following code on the right hand side here, which first opens the file and then does some operations on it like seeking, reading and printing out some of the stuff that was read. We had initial contents of the file my file two, which were just the characters foo, hash, bar, hash, bass. And the question was simply, what's the output printed by the program? Now, obviously that's maybe not a good question for an home exam because you could probably just enter the program, run it and test it out. Uh, so uh, nevertheless, I think that was a good exercise. So for the, the real exam, since this is a home exam, we would probably add, add a bit of a complication here because otherwise that would be too simple because we just need to add a main function, add a function around that stuff uh, and then run it. And that would have obviously been not what we wanted to achieve. We want you to understand what's going on. So what's happening here, we opened the file. So when we open a file, uh, our a pointer inside of the file is set to the very beginning to the before the first byte. So when we do an else seek here afterwards in line eight, we seek our character pointer or read pointer to position five. So we actually have a seek set. So this is an absolute position from the beginning of the file. We start counting at zero. So this is zero, one, two, three, four, five. So our read pointer would be at this a marked in red. And then our following read operation would then read from that file descriptor starting at our read pointer we just set with LSEQ. So we set it to read exactly three bytes into buffer. Buffer is big enough, it has space for 100 characters. Uh, we check if we could actually read three bytes. That's possible because we have A, R, and the hash mark here. So we'd actually read A, R, and the hash mark into our buffer here. And then finally in line 20, we set the byte after our hash mark to zero in our buffer. So it would actually print AR and hash. Uh, 
I think that should also be simple enough if you have uh, done some exercises with reading and working on files. And if not, of course, in situations like these, please feel free to consult the man page. That's what man pages are for, and that's what a home exam is for. Uh, 7.2 was then talking about file rights. So here was a little trick that might have required you to read the man page, this O append flag. So O append, as the name says, means that you actually append to the end of the file on a write instead of overwriting everything from the beginning. So uh, we had a file that contained the text Tweedle at the beginning here. And uh, then we write the characters D, E, and each. So just three characters to the file. And what happens when appending is that actually the uh, operating system does an else seek to the end of the file and then starts writing there. And so this means Tweedle is undisturbed and we just add our three characters D, E, E after this. So that might have required to read the man page a bit, uh, just because you might not have seen O append before. So a general hint is just read the code carefully. Why doesn't O trunk reset the else seek? Uh, because that's a good question. Um, I need to check this, to be honest. I don't have the man page here available on my notebook. Well, I do, but uh, it's a bit difficult when recording stuff. Uh, good question. I'll check it and maybe add to the slides later on when I put them online. Thanks for the question. Okay, question eight was about file systems. So we were talking about a traditional Unix system five file system uh, with two kilobyte blocks and you've seen the inode structures. So a kilobyte is 1024 bytes and four byte disk addresses. We had inodes that could contain 10 direct entries, one single indirect entry and one double indirect entry. So you've seen the inode structures before in the lecture. So the first question was to calculate the maximum possible file size that was supported in this file system. So for this, you would have had to go through, yeah, the inode structure. So you have 10 direct blocks, which had a link to two kilobyte each. So we had 10 times two kilobytes. Then you could have a link to another block. So each indirect inode block was also two kilobytes. Uh, this used four bytes. So you had like 512 entries times two kilobytes, plus the same again for our double indirect entries times two kilobytes. So this would give about 513 megabytes uh, if you just do the calculation. And it doesn't matter in which uh, size you give it. So like the number of kilobytes, if you want the number of bytes, if you want us to re really check all these digits or the number of megabytes, then round it here. So the next question was about fragmentation here. So what fraction of the disk space would be wasted if half of all files are exactly 1.5 kilobyte in size and the other half of all files would be two kilobytes. So this is a simple calculation again. So we know that uh, each file uses two kilobytes of size because that's our block size here. So all 1.5 kilobyte files actually use two kilobyte on disk and they waste 512 bytes. Uh, so essentially the fraction wasted is what we show here. So this is 12.5%. And then based on the same condition before, would it really help to reduce the fraction of wasted disk space if we change the block size to just one kilobyte? Now, I think that's intuitive because we're always wasting half of a kilobyte. So it wouldn't really matter because then all of your one kilobyte blocks would also only be half filled. So essentially you would also have a, util a, a, a fraction wasted of 12.5%. So going to one kilobyte blocks wouldn't help. What would help here, but that was not asked, is obviously to go to 512 byte blocks because then this 1.5 kilobyte block would actually save a block. All right. The next question was about understanding security. Um, so uh, the first question was about Unix login. So we explained what Unix login does. So it uh, reads a password and a user ID before logging you in. And the question was, can you explain how login can actually check passwords without storing the user's actual password in clear text on the system? So here, 
login can actually to do two things. So either login can only save the, uh, so you can only have an encrypted version of a password stored in the etc shadow file usually. So login would also encrypt the entered password and then just compare the encrypted version of the passwords here. Or if you don't want to do encryption, you could also do hashing. So you could store the hash of a password and you can check this against the hash of the entered password here. And uh, well, to explain why this is actually more secure, uh, this is because you keep the hash or the encrypted password that you compare against in a special file, etc shadow, as I mentioned already. And this is only readable by root, so not by a normal user. So nobody can read the encrypted or hash value and do, a, for example, a brute force decoding attack on that. And since login runs with root privileges, actually login is able to access ETC shadow, whereas a normal user is unable to do this. Uh, the second part of the security question was about subverting security. So the question was, if an attacker would actually be able to break into a Unix machine and obtain root permissions or privileges and manage to keep these root permissions because you had a sleepy admin that doesn't really figure out something's going wrong. So for many months, uh, the question was, what might the attacker actually do to uh, obtain the real passwords of the user, uh, even if they're not stored on the system? So of course, the attacker might try to do a brute force attack on that system on the stored passwords because the, the attacker could read etc shadow, but this takes lots of CPU time. So users would probably complain about the system being slow. So that would lead to the attacker being detected. So the other thing the attacker could do is it could overwrite the login program of the system with a malicious version that actually records all the characters that are entered. So this is sort of a key logger and uh, then it could just send this uh, log file with the clear text entered characters for usernames and passwords to wherever on the internet to the attacker. So that might be one option and then the attacker could actually, uh, obviously gain access to this. So this is a combination of using a security hole and then a bit of social engineering, just fooling the user into believing that the login prompt is really the system's login prompt and not the one you faked by replacing the login program. And we've seen approaches like in Windows NT, where you have to press a combination control, alt and delete in order, and this is not passed to any application. This is directly handled by the OS. So in order to get to your login screen, you have to press this key combination. Otherwise this won't show up and you won't be able to detect this key combination from your fake login program. So essentially the OS might be a bit more safer unless you manage to hack something else, obviously. And finally, sorry, I'm running a bit out of time because I have another uh, appointment at one o'clock. Uh, we talked about storage systems. So here, this is file systems lecture two, advanced storage systems. And this is about RAID devices. And we want to consider rate zero. So this means there's no redundancy. Data is just strapped across all disk rate one, which means we have an exact copy of each of the disks. So for each of the disks, we have a mirror copy and rate five where, rate five where we have strap parity. And so we had a system with eight disks of one terabyte each. And first you should figure out for each of these three rate levels, how much usable storage remains. So how much storage could you actually allocate? So for rate zero, if you had eight disks, you need to mirror each disk. So you have four usable, uh, no, sorry. If you have rate zero, you have striping, no redundancy. So you have eight disks, you just distribute the data over the disks. So you have all the eight terabytes available for rate one. You have mirroring. So for each disk, you need to have an identical copy. So you need to have two disks of one terabyte each to have one terabyte of usable storage. So this gives you four terabyte of storage. And for rate five, you use one disk for parity. So for checking the correctness and being able to correct missing bits of data. So you can uh, use seven disks for data, which would leave you with seven terabytes. And then uh, you should uh, figure out the performance of such a system. So uh, if you could actually access all these disks in parallel and all these disks could perform 100 reads per second, then uh, with rate zero, you could read all this in parallel because this is uh, just uh, yeah distributed over all your disks. So no single disk is a bottleneck. So we'll get 800 reads per second. For rate one, 
you could also get 800 reads per second. So this is not reduced to 400 reads per second because you could read once from the original disk and another block from the mirror disk. So that was a bit tricky maybe. And for rate five, we said uh, we, we do not do any verification on reads. So this would mean you could also use the bandwidth of all disks. So also 800 read requests per second because you wouldn't check the parity uh, on this additional disk. And we uh, then had the same question, but for writes. So for rate zero, you could write to all of the disks in parallel. For rate one, you have a reduction in bandwidth because you need to write a copy of data to two disks. So essentially you need to write every block twice. So this would uh, reduce your throughput to 400 writes per second. And for rate five, it depends. So if you do two reads and two writes to update the parity, you would reduce it to 200 writes per second. Or if you would need to read all of the disks to recalculate the parity, you would go down to 100 writes per second. So rate five is quite a bit slower here, but gives you additional security. So you always have this trade-off between capacity, read, write, uh, uh, yeah, throughput here of the disks. Uh, and, and that's uh, the different trade-offs between the rate levels. And the final two question was the uh, fault sensitivity. So first we wanted to know what the minimum number of disks is that may fail before data may be lost. So for rate zero, there's no redundancy. So uh, we cannot allow any disk failure here. And so as soon as the first disk is lost, we have data loss. Uh, for rate one, if you happen to lose uh, both disks in a pair, then your RAID 1 could already fail if the original disk and its mirror fails because you have no additional copies of that disk. So that would be the worst case. For RAID 5, it's also true, but data loss is here guaranteed on failure of the, on the second disk because you have less redundancy in RAID 5. And finally, uh, the other question, the question the other way around, what's the minimum number of disks that must fail to guaranteed have data loss? So for rate zero, it's obviously one disk because we don't have any redundancy. For rate one, if you're really lucky, uh, five disks could fail. If all of the four mirrors fail for the four original disks, and then the fifth the one of the original disks also fails, that would be the optimum situation, and then you are sure that you have lost data. But as we've seen before, there can be situations where you can have earlier data loss if you lose an original disk and its mirror. And for RAID 5, it's also these two disks again, as we've seen in the beginning. So that was a very quick walkthrough. I would encourage you to try to solve this stuff on your own if you haven't done so far and compare it to our results here. Um, so there was one question in the beginning uh, that I, uh, postponed. And that was uh, related to uh, our first question of fork. So uh, the question was, I thought that by running fork inside the if both times, that would be an error. Uh, no, no, that actually works. That's perfectly okay. It's just a system call in a new process. So you can do fork wherever you like. Um, ah, yeah, th that was, uh, okay. That was the other part of the question, okay. Let me check my iPad here is a bit acting up from which I'm controlling the slides. Okay, now we go back. So that was this question here, right? So uh, running fork inside the if both times is not an error, just generates two additional processes here. So one in line nine and run in line 17. Uh, so your solution you propose would be to write fork on line eight and then check if fork is equal or not equal to zero in line 17. Now that doesn't completely help because you, in a shell, you would want two child processes because each of these perform an exec here. So otherwise you would kill your original shell. I think that's what causes the confusion. All right, it's one o'clock. Uh, there's additional messages here. Okay. Is the XM going to be similar to this example XM? Yes, obviously, because otherwise that would be very, very unfair. Uh, so uh, similar exercises, similar difficulty, and of course also a similar amount of questions. So this uh, example XM was a hundred points. 
in 10 questions. And so also the number of points is relative to the more or less approximately relative to the amount of work you have to invest in this. And you will have four hours to solve this, yes. So maybe that's, uh, yeah, more than enough time. I don't know how much time you would require. Uh, but then again, I want to give you, I, I don't want to stress you, I want to give time to, time to recheck stuff, to go over stuff again. So I always hated being stressed as a student and I didn't want to inflict that stress on you. You have enough stress as it's going. So sorry, I have to leave this now because our comp seminar starts right away and I'm hosting that Zoom session and two Zoom sessions at the same time just don't work. So thanks for joining here. We'll publish the video and I'll also comment on the slides. And uh, yeah, good luck with the exam obviously. And if you have any questions in between, you know, how to reach us and go through all the questions again I mentioned in the uh, lecture 24, that should help. All right, have a good weekend and uh, see you in the exam later. Thank you.